Echo Club, environmentally conscious oysters. I like that oyster. Oysters are delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a quick look at your uh, your homepage and uh, some interesting things there. Um, the Plan Organization, P L A N. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Post Landfill Action right. Network. Right. Um, Okinawa doesn't use landfill techniques, right? Primarily burning. Yeah, that's kind of scary. But you still have to landfill the ash. Okay. So when you are incinerating garbage, yeah. you produce a lot of ash, mm -hmm. and the ash has a lot of toxic metals True. and other yeah. chemicals in it, yeah. and then all of the ash has to be landfilled. PCs and usually it, um, it leaches actually more than a regular landfill does. Okay, okay. Do you know what the current situation here is uh, regarding ash landfill? Ash, no. No. I don't know where they put it. No. No? I don't know where they put it. Yeah, right? So, um, these are things that I'm obviously interested in researching as well. I'm not sure how that will uh, translate into effectual change, but, uh, but uh, having awareness. I think. Uh, posted something on our eco Facebook last yes. year. There yeah. was a tour mm. that the citizens can go to this uh, um, garbage facility. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's a tour? <laughs> yeah. Is so it's all, it was all in Japanese. So okay. I just threw it out there. If yeah. anybody's interested in it, they can know yeah. where the garbage goes after they get picked up from your apartment or something. Yeah. So I don't know how far they will explain, uh -huh. but definitely yeah. there are opportunities to learn. We can ask just the high questions there, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. When I worked in the States, I brought all of my students uh, to the waste treatment plants yeah. as, a, as, a, really, yeah. as a field trip to learn about where their food goes. Yeah. <laughs> we had that in elementary school too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah actually, locals do that mm -hmm. as well. My girls do that. Mm -hmm. The um, water waste treatment thing, yeah. So, who started Echo Club and, and why? Was it one of you? Yeah? It was me and two other people that are no longer here, unfortunately. Okay. Um, uh, Thomas and Julia are a couple of my both moved to France now. Yeah. Um, I think I might have met them. Hmm? I mean, think I might have met You know them, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's Julia is an artist also okay. and um, has organized all of the art. Uh, auctions for different mm. conservation efforts. Mm. Um, but yeah, we were just like talking and trying to think about how we could make OIST a little bit, yeah. just a little bit better. Yeah. Because OIST has um, a policy in their, I guess it's kind of like a constitution, PRP, yeah. and it really specifically says that they want to be um, a positive example mm. of of sustainability yeah, and sustainability. they want to have a really positive impact on the Okinawan environment. Yeah, yeah. And some of that is visible in the architecture of the original buildings. Mm -hmm. So one of our buildings is actually LEED certified. Okay. And um, and the first three buildings of the cluster yeah. have a very small footprint. So yeah. it's not like a normal university campus mm -hmm. where you have a whole bunch of landscaping and mm -hmm. space in between. Mm -hmm. You have the skywalks that go over the jungle. So the jungle as much as possible is not um, right. disturbed. Yeah. But unfortunately, the newer construction has kind of moved away from those ideals. I know the lead architect on Lab 4 and 5, I mm. think he does. <laughs> but uh, interesting. No, that's, that's great. Um, when did you no, start this? When did we start it? A couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, I really, it was like three, three years ago. Yeah. And our first thing we really wanted to think about was plastic because it's really visible and mm. it's kind of, it seems like it should be easy, mm. right? Like changing construction is a little bit outside of our reach. Right. And so we felt like because the plastic thing is so visible and like individuals can make that choice, can make that change, and therefore it should be easy, but it wasn't easy at all. It was the yeah. opposite of easy. Mm -hmm. So like we we tried to make a connection in people's yeah. minds between how much plastic they're creating mm -hmm. themselves in oyst 
um, and kind of like what we see when we go out to the beach and stuff, yeah. because everyone goes out to the beach and like, oh my god, this is terrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the fact that like their personal actions are contributing to that yes. is not really the connection that most people make. Yeah. Yeah. So we really wanted to try to make that connection, mostly with um, like visual posters yeah, and the wall. And mm -hmm. the plastic wall. Yeah. So that was a big. That was our first project, and that mm -hmm. was a lot of effort. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Maki and I running around after every meal, pulling garbage out of the oh, garbage really? cans yeah. because uh, we had um, separate containers all over campus yes. for people to separate their plastic bags uh -huh. from their bento boxes. Uh -huh. Um, but nobody wants to do that. Everyone wants to put their bento box in their plastic bag, tie it up, and throw it in the can. So, um, despite the one opening, it. yeah. Well, uh, really. Display. Well, yeah. yeah. You didn't have a shema at every, you know, garbage bin. Thing. We did in the cafeteria. Yeah. So at lunch every day in the actual cafeteria, like when people came to put their garbage in the can, we, you know, be like, hey, we're doing this project. Do you mind separating? And where we were physically, people were mostly okay with it. Yeah. yeah. But we also had cans in all the lunchrooms with like signs that said we're doing this project, please separate. Mm. And those ones were much less utilized. Mm. So that was, we tried to go after lunch was over, we just went to every single lunchroom on the whole campus to try to sort those out so that yeah. we could have as close to an accurate number as yeah. possible yeah. because of the janitors took away all of those bags and we wouldn't have a real count on how many we were producing. Yeah. Yeah. And how much did you accumulate? So it was Monday through Friday for yeah. one week, yeah. and it was tw over 1,200 bags. Just for, just, just for lunchtime. Just lunchtime. Just, just lunchtime in the morning. Or the yeah, just wow. from 12 to 1. Is that from the cafeteria, Ventos, Convenis? Yeah, there's some outside ones. Like occasionally we'd see like a Family Mart one yeah. or like a Jimmy's one, mm. but the vast majority of them were just from lunch. Just from this cafeteria. Yeah. Cafeteria, and then we had yeah. like three outside vendors coming in and then put up their I tables. See. On those, yeah. And then I think the thing that is just most frustrating about the whole situation mm -hmm. is that people buy their bento and then it gets put in a plastic bag wrapped up. And then they walk about 15 feet yeah. to their table and unwrap it and eat yeah. it. And it's just like, and even if you are going back to the lab, like, okay, so it's like, you know, 100 meters. Right. Like it's, it. you can just carry it, and it's and it just seems like such a surp superfluous mm. piece of mm. material that you just don't need to have it. But there's so much pushback. Nobody wanted them to be taken away, right. and when people walked through the hall and looked yeah. at all the bags that they collected, um, the majority of people were like, "Oh, it's, it's not that many. Like it's not even that bad. Oh, it's really? totally fine. We can keep mm -hmm. keep yeah, on no business way. as usual." So it actually almost almost backfired. Oh yeah. no! <laughs> oh no! Well, and what um, what media attention was drawn through this this effort? Um, I think not that much. Really? Um, we had the so we had the exhibit during our open campus, mm. which means that about five thousand people walked by it. Mm. So there was a lot of eyeballs on it. Yes. Um, but. Actual media, there wasn't so much. Mm. It's a shame. I'm sure, sure someone would be interested in in having those statistics of, you know, five days worth of lunch, mm. the population of however many hundreds of people you have here. Just accumulate that many wasted mm -hmm. bags, right? And, even, and I think the biggest point of the whole thing is that, like, the plastic bag is the can just like a counter basically for how many bentos got thrown away That's and right. all of the plastic right. that goes into those bento boxes. Yeah, and chopsticks. Yeah. 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 It's just, and it's an astronomical yeah. amount of trash that is completely yeah. avoidable. Wow. Um, I hope you don't think it was a useless effect, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure it affected some of and that's probably the, the whole objective, right? Mm -hmm. You can change a few people, you can therefore, mm -hmm. you know, um, affect a few more. Um, I think the thing that I learned from the whole situation mm -hmm. is that it's probably not about individual people. Yeah. Um, I've had lots of people come up to me afterwards and be like, oh, like, every time that I get a plastic bag because I don't stop them fast enough, Mm -hmm. I always feel really guilty and I think about you and I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. 
that's not really the point. Like, I don't want my friends to like feel guilty. It's it's not their fault. It's it's the industry, yeah. and we really need it to stop at a different part of the supply chain. We yeah. need Family Mart to not put a single thing automatically into one bag. Mm -hmm. We need mm -hmm. restaurants to not put things into plastic bags. We need yeah. hotels and companies to mm -hmm. make the change at a higher level, even government level, mm -hmm. in order for the change to really be enacted. Because you can't put that on regular people. It's not their fault that the businesses are doing these things. Mm -hmm. So, for convenience, right? Yeah, like for, for vendors, when we talked about it, the plastic bags part, it's their money. They're spending that money. Of course. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. It's 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 the cost. So one of the guys was saying, if we don't have to use them, it's good for us. So we're up for it. Mm -hmm. For some reason, we talk to the vendors directly. We talk to the section that's mm -hmm. in charge of the vendors mm -hmm. here. But there is no like a communication about it. So there's still this free in plastic bags. Mm -hmm. So if the vendors are happy that distributing them, Mm -hmm. Invoiced, for example, or any um, yeah. situation like this can say, okay, please don't distribute the bags, and we'll come up with something else, then everyone will be happy. And people get used to the new custom and have it. But yeah. I, that I think some people are scared of change. Yeah, absolutely. And being Japanese, I think Japanese people are very comfortable with how things currently are, mm -hmm. and then it takes a lot of effort to change, and it, it almost think of the change as inconvenience rather than rather than like development of the community. That's true. So I know some other restaurants in Nuda that did their own statistics for their customers, yeah. and they actually switched their lunch catering mm -hmm. from. Um, is it called recyclable material? Okay. Well, or recyclable material yeah. to completely stainless, so reusable. Oh, wow. So they'll take them back and wash them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more work for them in a way, yeah. but in the long run, cost effective. Right. And Inventory control. You never have to buy another. Yeah, and they stopped serving straws a long time ago, yeah. and then they realized that actually a lot of customers don't even need straws. Yeah. So they put up a sign saying, if you really need them, please let us know, we're yeah, happy to provide it for you. Yeah. But majority of them don't ask. Yeah. But unless you try it, mm. you know, and a lot of places don't know how to try. Mm -hmm. And what's most frustrating for me is like, we, I've had an opportunity to talk to some hotels here. They don't even know where to start. But they're the big company. They got the money to cover the somewhat like cost mm -hmm. to test a new ways. That's where I operation. Yeah. Exactly. So but they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And then they ask us, like, what can we do? But uh, we don't know how you guys operate. We can suggest that the, these materials, these ways that's mm -hmm. been successful in other places. Right, right. But I don't know what's personally don't know what is the setback because it seems like to me they have powers to make the change, mm -hmm. and they have a power to kind of cover up the failure if they fail. Right. But they don't, they don't do that, they don't take risks. Yeah, it's, it's a sad situation. I think it's really interesting too. I think you said two things that are really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think the reusable containers, that was really our first yeah. hope and dream for OIST. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned PLAN, the Postland Fill Action Network. And they work with universities, in, mostly in North America, so mm -hmm. Canada and the United States, mm -hmm. um, to really transition the whole university to being waste-free. Mm -hmm. And the way that big universities have done that, like Harvard mm -hmm. has done it, um, is this reusable container. You can take it home, and then in order to get another one, you have to give it back. Okay. So if you want lunch the next day, yeah. you have to bring back your container, and then they wash it in their industrial dishwasher. Mm -hmm. so it's, sanitized yeah. that can be used for another person yeah. and then another student can get a reusable container and go eat their lunch wherever they're going to eat it. Mm -hmm. And that's really, that's the system that we wanted to have here mm -hmm. at Oist. Mm -hmm. And um, that would be great for universities in general in Japan because the bento system is really not just, not just Oist, right? There's tons of plastic bentos being thrown out. So that system is really like the gold standard. And a lot of universities in North America have successfully implemented it and they save money and it's also kind of a of selling point for the university um, in this day and age young people especially care about this kind of thing mm -hmm. so when they're shopping around for what university they want to go to they're like oh wow they're like going above and about beyond to like mm -hmm. make 
yeah. a difference in the world. Like this yeah. is the type of place that I want to be associated right, with. Right. This is the type of place that I want to live and work at. So like I think especially always being an innovative kind of future looking university, they really would benefit a lot in many different facets if they were to take on a system like that. Mm -hmm. And it could be used at hotels too. Um, and some cities because there's so much takeaway now, really. Yeah. It's seamless and mm -hmm. DoorDash, like everyone okay. gets all of their food on apps and mm -hmm. the, all the food is just delivered. Um, That's true. So in San Francisco and New York City now, there's pods. Yeah. And so same system, you get all of your deliveries mm -hmm. in these reusable containers yeah. and there's um, return pods around mm -hmm. the city. Okay. So you can just drop them back in and they yeah. get sanitized and reused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now these are some, some awesome points. Can I um, shift from Echo Club and can you please tell us what research and, and um, what are you doing uh, oh. concerning the mangroves is your specialty, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, I study mangrove ecology. Right. So basically how the Okinawa, the north of Okinawa is the northern limit mm. um, habitat for one of the mangrove species. I see. Why do we distribute it? Uh -huh. and, um, in the West Pacific area, yeah. and so I wanted to see how the climate change may be affecting this distribution mm. um, using genetic method and uh, physical oceanography, because the mangrove sea travels through the current. So I wanted to know how much of the uh, habitat or populations in different islands are connected genetically, if they are actually traveling from Iriomote to Okinawa Island, okay. or to San Miyako, and that will determine the range of at a conservation mm -hmm. area and mm -hmm. the island systems are some understudied compared to um, continental kind mm -hmm. of alongshore study for this type of things. So Mango is one of the um, I think most important coastal habitat right. when it comes to just ecological um, relationship with coral yeah. reefs because okay. it's a nursery habitat for a lot of reef fish. Mm -hmm. So without the forest, a lot of fish would be endangered. And that will may affect, maybe not in Okinawa so much, but mm -hmm. a lot of Southeast Asia with the fishermen. And a lot of their life is depending on the fisheries. So, but a lot of this area, Indonesia and around that area has a lot of islands. The mm -hmm. study for mangrove ecology is very limited compared to corals. So I kind of wanted to contribute to that part. Yeah, great, great. What are the main things you've found um, concerning Okinawa mangroves? And so Okinawa mangroves are very abundant. Unique. It's unique yeah. and then its number of species why it's a lot less because it's higher in latitude. It's almost too cold for a lot of mangrove species to survive. But those that are uh, growing here are mm -hmm. um, actually very limited to local scales. They're not really dispersing far away. Mm. So if you were to design a um, conservation area, it has to be really local scale and local um, government have to really watch the shift in habitat. Mm. And so that's where I think that overall environmental kind of problem here yeah. that I think is concerning is that there's like a disconnect between nature that we get a lot from yeah. in our life. There's certainly disconnect, even though a lot of people see ocean every single day, yeah. they go to a you know, shop store and right. buy a lot of plastic stuff, yeah. and there's no real connection between the local environment and in their lives. So I think that, um, in thesis maybe I can point that out as in yeah. the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> we need more, yeah. more connection. Of course, yeah. So, yeah. Amazing. But it's um, it's very abundant. A lot of times mm. people like to uh, plant mm. mangroves. The mangrove seed pods, right? Mm. The, the, the and sometimes they are planting wrong species in the wrong location that yeah. they become very uh, kind of, they trap pollution in the river system and stuff. So they actually have to cut them out afterwards. So Okinawa government actually implemented the law that you need a permission to plant mm. In places in Okinawa. You bring up a good point. Fish yeah. yeah. Good. Do you want the garbage to wash out the sea, yeah. or do you want it to no. stay and then you can yeah. clean it up? Yeah. True. But it also <laughs> con contributes to silt and, oh. uh, and, and, and that kind of water, which might clog yeah. the flow of, 
natural. But you also don't want that stuff leaving either. And so that, like the natural mm. the natural function mm. of a mangrove forest and the estuary mm. is to clean mm. all of their water right, that's right. leaving the land and going out into the ocean. I see. And so that's that's what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to catch all the dirt, all yeah. the silt. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but it creates silt as well, right? Kind of, kind of catches it. it just, okay. Yeah, it's like a, it's like if you think about like a salt marsh or something in um, like a continental system. Okay. As the water flows through it, mm -hmm. it gets cleaned, yeah. and it works the same way in a mangrove forest. Right, right. And then the water that goes actually out into the ocean mm -hmm. is clean water. Mm -hmm. And so the removal of mangroves and the removal of salt marshy type areas, mm -hmm. um, estuaries, yeah. and the cementification mm -hmm. causes a lot more pollution to go into the water. I see. But like you were saying that the wrong type of mangrove in the wrong area could be more damaging than mm -hmm. good, right? From like our societal point of view, I think there's okay. been some dredged river in Ishikawa. Okay. You know, people started planting it yeah. for the site purposes, mm -hmm. but then there, the silt in the mud actually accumulated and it just smelled so bad. And a lot, it's a residence That's area, so the city actually yeah. um, pulled them off. So well, that was a, a dredged river, right? So it wasn't a natural yeah, system. Natural system. Yeah. 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 So those mm. things, people don't know, oh, it's tree, it must be good for environment, and just they just plant them. Yeah. But the yeah. mangrove system is actually a lot more complicated. Mm. Yeah, I had a similar situation when uh, I was growing up in my community in Australia. Um, it wasn't even subtropical like Okinawa. Um, it was quite south, mm -hmm. the southern part. Um, but uh, a mangrove tree just started growing out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Probably, you know, a seed got stuck in the, in the mud somewhere. And the community was all upset about it. And we could get rid of this. They, they become noxious weeds. They take over the whole. Um, you know, aquatic environment. Um, but on what I'm hearing now is that was part of the natural course and probably something they should have mm -hmm. let go of. And they actually did. It stayed and flourished. And, mm -hmm. and now um, I'm sure it all looks pretty clean. But um, if something just starts vegetating there uh, mm -hmm. out of nowhere, I, this is 30 years ago, so mm -hmm. education on the matter was probably quite limited. And in hindsight, um, probably wrong, right? But, what they were going to do. Interesting, so. because there's a study on Florida that mm. actually the mangrove is migrating forward, mm. so the more um, colder mm. latitude region. Okay. And there, the primary um, environment is the seagrass. Okay. But then mangrove started to reach it. Probably the propagules or the seas yeah. have been reaching them mm -hmm. there, but they don't survive because it was too cold, I but see. because of the uh, Winter temperature is mm. getting higher warmer. and warmer, mm. so they could survive the winter and they start growing and they became actually considered invasive species. Yeah. So there was a huge um, kind of debate right. that it's in invasive species mm. and the indigenous species mm. are, may not survive the most right. in growth. So that might be interesting. Yeah, That's yeah, possibly, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of time there, obviously. Sean was mentioning earlier that uh, he's noticed some mangroves dying because of yeah. ocean trash, um, the effects of, right? Yeah. You said you saw that here in Okinawa? Yeah, it's up north. And uh, I photographed it like every once in a while I'll go through my hard drive and I'll find photographs, but it was one of those things where you couldn't actually get to the tape of plastic off of the rope and stuff like that, but it was across a river and a big cement wall. And of course, I noticed, like later when I looked at the photograph, that the trees and the leaf, well, the, the trees were still there, but the leaves actually fell off of the tree. Mm -hmm. So it was being smothered by the amount of plastic and, and a rope that was wrapped around it. So, and I was thinking, could that actually happen? But then, it, you know, the last uh, few months I've been looking for more of them. I haven't been finding any, which is a good thing, right? Yeah. But I still find a lot of uh, plastic and nets and, yeah. and just all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. just, just stuck onto it, yeah. it just attracts and it gets stuck to it and nobody's taking any initiative to take it off. So that's something that people can actually do to, you know, to improve it. I think those trees could become like nets in the ocean, oh, they, right? They, they because they are, yeah, nets. sometimes the water raises 
up above all the leaves and uh, yeah. I'm sure it just catches they're, everything. They're right? basically like a sacred forest, sacred yeah. tree, right? A sacred forest of the ocean, so we need to uh, protect them. And they block for coastal erosion as well, right? Yeah. Have you seen much, uh, many, much efforts for mangrove conservation here? Not in Okinawa because no. it's not a problem. Like mm -hmm. uh, the habitat's been well kept, mm -hmm. and it's actually growing in area. Mm -hmm. So yeah, not in Okinawa. Well, you really like historically though, like you know, most of the rivers, mm -hmm. rivers now, mm -hmm. um, and coastline has been changed. Yeah. Right. There's now cementification. Yeah. Almost it's seventy percent of the coastline has been converted from natural coastline to cement. Mm -hmm. So, is is that like what is the time scale that you're thinking of? Like you're saying it's not a problem here. So this is since nineteen seventies. So after. So after the cement started. Right. So mm -hmm. now it's returned to Japan and started accumulating more records mm -hmm. of coastal area. Mm -hmm. So we have aerial photographs and stuff like that mm -hmm. as a, to keep the record. But before that, we Okinawa didn't really have much of that kind of information. It was all told through, I don't know, former mayors to okay. the current mayor. And it's like, what? And well, those grandmas and exactly. grandfathers yeah. passing it on. A lot of the landfill projects were estuary type areas, like in Naha with the airport. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a landfill project that used to be reef and mangrove, and now it's cement. So yeah. it's something that we have to investigate through like a people and like a historical documents mm -hmm. and that rather than just a coastal development records, right. and which is a lot harder and I think time consuming. So I don't know fully sure, but yeah, in Yomoto, for example, they used to grow rice there a lot yes. and then they cut down mango um, forest to make a rice field mm -hmm. and then now yeah. they are out into the forest mm -hmm. this is a national park. Yeah. And stuff like that. They're doing some great things in Yomoto, mm -hmm. right? Did they get certified? Uh, as UNESCO yet, yeah. still in application. Mm -hmm. Too much garbage. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of places that you know, Yomote has a lot of places that the people don't go, including mangrove forest. Mm -hmm. When I had with the sample, yeah. the sampling, I specifically picked the sites that the no tourists will go, mm -hmm. and I see garbage everywhere yeah. on the beach, in the forest, mm -hmm. and so I don't think uh, mm -hmm. unless they solve that problem, I think they'll get. That's an unsolvable yeah. problem yeah. because there's some coming from the island, but most of it's come, being delivered from the ocean. Yeah. So all of humanity has to stop throwing exactly. plastic in the ocean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> come on, humanity. Yeah, true. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Sean, tell us about, um, actually you just finished a big interview, but uh, other than um, mangroves and, and home crabs, what uh, issues do you see as being prevalent for Okinawa? Uh, environmental yes. impact of, of tourism. Yeah, so just the big thing is just uh, respect, right? Just the amount of people that come here, and uh, it could be just a simple thing of taking shells off of, this, mm. of off the beach, right? What do you call that? As far as scavenging? Uh, yeah, just shell collecting, right? Yeah. So it's just one of the things that people want to bring back souvenirs, right? And uh, that's just part of the trick. But they don't realize that that shell is potentially a home to an animal, right? Or it could be a home to an animal. But when people overtake things, now there's no available homes for other uh, hermit crabs to use as they get as they grow. They need to change mm -hmm. their shell often, and so now that's not available. So what they do is they use plastic instead. So if there's any plastic caps, yeah. dishwashing caps, laundry caps, uh, glass bottles broken, they will adapt with that temporarily, making do, and then of course. But the sad thing is, there's just not enough shells available at this at this time because people are over collecting them. I think respect yeah. is a really, really good point, yeah. and I think that respect is key to another project that Maki and I worked on. Um, to tell. We so we we wanted one of the things that I noticed first when I got to Okinawa mm -hmm. is that dive practices here mm -hmm. are really different than anywhere else that I've been, and the volume of people at an individual site is. Um, very, it's it's kind of insane. Human pollution, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and and then the way that people behave underwater is uh -huh. is also really alarming because That's people true. are wearing gloves and they're touching mm -hmm. the coral and they don't have the buoyancy controls that they need in order to stay above the coral and to not kick the coral. Mm -hmm. um, so 
basically I convinced Maki and a couple other people <laughs> to do a ridiculous project with me that took a year. And um, it was fun. But we together went diving every single weekend and did coral coverage surveys of um, four, four sites on a gradient of tourism usage. Mm -hmm. So the highest usage was, was Maeda mm -hmm. Blue Cave, which yep. um, we counted has over 1,500 people per hour in the summer months. It's pretty great, isn't it? Um, and then we had some kind of medium usage sites like Cape, Cape Monzamo, mm -hmm. and then we had a no usage site, which was near Sisova Island, which you needed a boat to get there. Okay. It was not like a site that people would go to. Yeah. Um, and every month we counted how many corals there were on a transect, and then what conditioned health those corals were in, mm -hmm. and how many fish were around at the sites, yeah. um, other indicator species like um, sea urchins and uh, coral, coral shrimps. Um, and we really wanted to see if there was a difference between these high usage sites compared to these really low usage sites. Mm -hmm. And we found that um, Cape Maida has significantly less coral coverage than the other sites that we visited. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a shift in the type of coral. So the other sites that we visited, there was a lot more branching coral, mm -hmm. and at Maeda there was mostly boulder or encrusting coral. Okay. And so those corals are obviously more resistant to breakage, mm -hmm. um, and they're also more resistant to disease. Okay. So they're kind of just more robust species. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you can never say that there's causation here, but there is some correlation between the amount of people that are <coughs> using the site mm -hmm. regularly um, and, and the actual health of the site. And in, and there's been other people that have studied this in different areas, in Australia and the Caribbean, and there's kind of like a, a, UN, a UN recommendation for how many people can use a single site yeah. in order for it to stay pristine. I see. Sustainability. Yeah, um, and it's 12 people a day. So, um, <laughs> wow, really? So, I mean, you have to think about what you want. Right? Yeah. So pristine is yeah. a really high... Mm -hmm. In order for the, it to be as if people had not been there, mm -hmm. you can have 12 people mm -hmm. a day. Um, if you want to make some sacrifices, you, know, you could have more people a day. But if you're going to have 3,000 people a day, you're probably going to sacrifice a lot. 1,500 an hour? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was golden week. That was our highest number. But um, that's a lot of people. Wow. And if those people are not so actually you're trained... you in the water too, of course. <laughs> They're not trained divers. They're they're on try dives. Yeah. They're not even yeah. they're not even patty uh -huh. um, like discovered dives. Mm -hmm. There's no training. A lot of times, sometimes they don't even wear fins. They're yeah. just dragged yeah. through yeah, the water. Right. Right. Um, and so it's not safe for the tourists. A lot of people dive, and it's also not safe for the reef. And so there really needs to be a movement towards more sustainable diving. I think mm. I think a really good example is Bonaire. There's no gloves allowed on the entire island. If you go to Bonaire, you are not allowed to wear gloves. And that keeps the coral safe. Because when you're wearing gloves, you feel safe. Okay. You can just you reach out and grab. Okay. And if you take away those gloves, people are a lot more careful about what they touch. They might mm -hmm. just put a finger out mm -hmm. if they need to steady themselves. Yeah. Um, or they will really work a lot harder to be right. better buoyant. Right. Right. So that, that's a really easy first step for tourism, if they want to say, like, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a green dive shop, I don't yeah. use gloves, that would be really great. Uh, the, um, the results of your findings, uh, are they on this Brisbane Plankton website? Yeah, sorry, I haven't uh, checked it out yet, but uh, it's very interesting. Sean, do you know if there's any, actually, anyone, um, any overseeing regulatory body um, keeping an eye on Okinawan dive shops as far as no sustainable practices. It doesn't exist. doesn't exist that I know of. How do they get their licenses? Is there, you just... I think Maki knows a fair bit about this. Yeah. You went, she went, were you at that meeting too? There was a meeting um, that you went to about having green fins start in Okinawa. Green fins? I, I never heard of that. It was one of the things that Eduardo wrote you into. Who did? Eduardo. Eduardo oh, Sanchez. Yes. Yeah. He's a funny guy. It was like a very initial meeting, so there was not much mm -hmm. going on. I don't know if it's ground or if there was a second meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, because uh, Onosom is a very funny place. The, the, fisher, the fishermen and dive shops, they are not really in that kind of... The Kerala divers are stronger than fishermen, so mm -hmm. they they actually are more forward in diving, I think, 
practices. Mm -hmm. But Ona, despite this density of tourism, mm -hmm. there's not really a control mm -hmm. over the mm -hmm. diving practices mm -hmm. in uh, either party. Fishermen don't really do anything with it. To that divers and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the point of making this like a new meeting. But, um, green uh, the green fins is the UM initiative. Okay. Um, that I think the problem with the program potentially, and specifically the reason that it hasn't been adopted in Japan, yeah. is that it was originally developed to target developing countries. Mm -hmm. And um, Japan is not a developing country and doesn't want to be labeled that way. And so they don't want to be a program, part of the program. But the, um, the, the actual policies and suggestions in the Green Fence program are really good. Mm -hmm. And if we could repackage that yeah. to make it a little bit more yeah. swallowable, yeah. Yeah. then it would really help the, the coral mm -hmm. ecosystem here in Okinawa. There's one dive shop in Maeda that's very conscious to mm -hmm. take Takeda to mm -hmm. Okinawa. Yeah, they, they were yeah. operated with us more than any of the other yeah. dive shops did. Okay. Ta Take? Okay. They're right there, located right before you go into my mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Another big problem too is feeding the fish. Yeah. This food. stupid sausage. Oh, no, no. Okay. It's food now. Food. Okay. Food. okay. Is yeah. that what those round yeah. bread things yeah. are? Yeah. Food. Okay. It's gluten based product. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that attracts a lot of yeah, bacteria. It's, it's just, it's just uh, but it just yeah. fills them up and yeah. it's definitely not good for them because it's the population of batfish, there used to be hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. and I've been diving by the point since 1992. Yeah. Okay. And I've seen hundreds to thousands of them and dwindling they just all went away. And I think a lot of it was was came down to uh, overfeeding and um, man made product. Honestly. I do. Yeah. It's it's bad for the yeah. fish and it's yeah. bad for the whole ecosystem yeah. because it creates a lot of waste mm -hmm. that then is uh, metabolized by bacteria which changes the oxygen <laughs> dynamic. Think good can come from this, and then there's bacterial waste in the water. It's it's a mess. It's really fast. I can't I can't understand why that agreement got started. How anyone ever said that was okay? Where the big money Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone wants to clean that photo with the value yeah, of the fish, fish yeah. hanging around. Right? Yeah, we'll stop overfishing, then there'll be more fish. Crazy, yeah. man. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, lots of uh, lots of great insights today, guys. So your specialty is uh, coral reefs. My specialty is microbiology. Microbiology. So how do you study that in the ocean? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You can go down this road if you yeah. want. Take, take down the microscope. And... No, so most of it is genetics. Okay. So I take a whole bunch of seawater and I filter it onto a filter, mm -hmm. which captures all of the cells that you can't see. Mm -hmm. And then I extract either DNA or RNA from the filter, mm -hmm. and I sequence all of that. And then I use um, different computer programs to classify and count all of these sequences. So that tells me what, which organisms are in which place and, and what relative abundance they were at. And so I can use this method to study how um, different environmental factors affect the microbial population in a different place. So I've used this to look at like, the whole Kuroshio current, like all the way from Taiwan all the way okay. to Japan, yeah. and from the surface all the way down to hydrothermal vents all the way at 3,000 meters, uh, to see mm -hmm. how the microbial community changes with depth, with latitude, um, with different ocean currents, um, which is really interesting just on like, a broad ecological point of view, mm -hmm. um, but locally here in Okinawa, mm -hmm. I've used this method to see how um, runoff affects the runoff. microbial communities in the, the red coastal. Soil. Red soil, that's smothering everything, right? Is that? Well, it's hard to say. We don't really know where it goes. Mm -hmm. So if you go diving, mm -hmm. you know, a couple days after a big rain, I don't suggest it because of the microbial results, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. if you do, yeah. um, you don't see a buildup of red soil okay. in the lagoons or on the reefs. Yeah. Um, so most of it is being transported offshore, okay. and we don't really know where it goes. And that's where Maki does numerical modeling. And we're going to try to do some numerical modeling to figure out like, where it's really going wow. and how long it's staying yeah. in the reef area. Um, but with soil also comes carbon, bacteria, um, heavy metals. Fecal uh, matter. Fecal matter, yes. <laughs> um, 
fertilizers, you have nitrogen and phosphorus, and that changes the coastal environment and yeah. how microbes will respond. And the microbes being the base of everything, they're mm -hmm. going to affect coral, the fish, the people. So, um, yeah, so we, we basically monitoring the bacterial community before, during, and after big storms last year to see how the bacterial community changed uh, with all that runoff. Mm -hmm. And um, we found some pretty nasty bugs. Um, really? Yeah, some pretty nasty bugs are in the water uh, during a rainstorm and immediately following a rainstorm that are coming from pig farms and yeah. sewage treatment yeah. and also just from some regular farms from, from manure, manure and fertilizer. Yeah, yeah. I, I see big chunks of all kinds of things like that floating around after a big storm. I'm usually yeah. I'm in the water at the same time, so keep your mouth closed. Yeah, keep your mouth closed. <laughs> keep your mouth closed and don't go in if you have any open sores. Yeah, right. Like, and that's just from overflow, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's exasperated by coastal development. So part of the reason why all of that stuff is going into the water mm -hmm. is because our entire coastline is concrete mm -hmm. instead of natural systems. Mm -hmm. So if there was grass mm -hmm. or forest, mm -hmm. all of that stuff would get stopped okay. yep. and cleaned. Mm -hmm. But because all the entire coastline and this part of, mm -hmm. of Okinawa is cement, yeah. And cement is not porous, right? Mm -hmm. So all of that water is just collecting stuff mm -hmm. and just runs right into the ocean. And so there's, there's nothing to stop it or slow it down or clean it. And um, that's, that's a really, really big problem that's going to get worse. And the coastal development, the way that people keep building new projects right up against the ocean mm -hmm. is just mm -hmm. really bad for everything. That's true. Absolutely. I'm, I'm surprised and actually sickened by the lack of foresight, oversight, mm -hmm. lack of strategic planning long term in, in regards to you know, the coastline. Yeah. And not just tourism oversupply of hotel rooms, which is another thing. Transportation is also infrastructure. The roads, like the roads mm -hmm. and the cars. And yeah. <laughs> like I said, the, the stupidity of humans is like... Yeah. Exactly. I, live, I live in my area. Yeah. And, um, the rate of Airbnb construction mm -hmm. and the way that they really just jam them right against the ocean mm -hmm. is just mm -hmm. it's really amazing. Um, I'm sure you know the one uh, by the dam over like on your yeah, way. Yeah, you just built them in the two new ones right there. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, like, right, it's like yeah. literally built in the beach. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, it was part of the fishing port. Yeah. 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 It was, yeah, it was, it's like reclaimed land that they put a little seawall around and now they put two buildings there. Two white play by the, duplex. By the flood zone and a tight Right, oh man, I can't wait for another tram to come. Uh, it's, it's kind of scary there. <laughs> yeah, the trammy, absolutely. Yeah. Trammy was scary at my house and my house, my house, my house is honestly like yeah. from like a, um, an ecological point of view too close to the beach. Mm -hmm. um, but it was built way before I moved there, and it, it was it was scary. Trammy was really scary, and yeah. I have trees behind that. There's trees between my house and the beach. There's like it's small, but yeah. there are some trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That place yeah. is gonna get pummeled. Smash. Like it's concrete, right? Yeah, well they're gonna have windows, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have the shutters. There's not very much of that around here. Yeah. My parents live in Florida, and um, whenever there's a hurricane, they just cover all the windows with the hurricane shutters. They have bar stuff. They do have bars, yeah. Bars. And on campus, the first floor had like the yeah. shatterproof glass that has like, a little metal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, the green thing. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. There's going to be more storms, and they're going to be stronger. Um, there's there's some really good modeling that. It's very specific that, especially in this part of the world, um, in the Pacific, with the Western Pacific, mm -hmm. the number of land falling Category 5 typhoons is going to increase. Um, so, Okinawa is going to have going to have some big typhoons coming up. Exciting times ahead. Yeah, I kind of love typhoons. Either right, <laughs> lockdown. I love them. <laughs> Break up the whiskey. Yeah, it's exciting. It's fun to see like how powerful nature is. Yeah, it's super energy, humbling. Energy it just does you know, like mm -hmm. like lightning storms. Yeah. Really fun, yeah. What um what can we do? People? 
you know, you guys are very proactive in in, in research and and uh, projects, and uh, especially getting the word out through you know, National Geographic and, and your own um, activities as well. But uh, how do you think the average Joe can can get involved and, and make a difference? What would you say is the first thing they should be doing? I think connect, building connect, connection mm. from, different, from different angles, not only from our life to environment, but like community, American yeah. community and Japanese community. If you are in four industries, there are hotels yeah. that are catered to Americans, there are hotels mm -hmm. catered to Japanese. And, but if my like a struggle and dilemma that I had after doing the eco events yeah. so many times mm -hmm. that we can do so much from like grassroots mm -hmm. um, actions. Yeah, it, yeah. Something has to yeah. come from top down. Mm -hmm. And for us to influence the top mm -hmm. as a scientist, mm -hmm. we need some median and we lack this median. So somebody has to be the connector between those people who have the power to make changes yeah. and us mm -hmm. and make sense of it because mm -hmm. we don't talk money but we talk science yeah. and then they'll tell people yeah. don't talk science mm -hmm. but they talk money mm -hmm. and they both make sense and both ha are needed in the community and Okinawa itself still the minimum wage is one of the lowest amongst the nation they are on the edge of like making everyday life so for them to care about environment yeah. their life have to get better Yes. So the money part cannot be ignored, the scientists tend to ignore, mm -hmm. and like more, more animal, more nature, more yeah. whatever, but yeah. like we all really have to convey this message that we are not actually really trying, we are trying to protect the nature, yeah. but by doing so we're take, protecting the humanity in the future, our children, our grandchildren. So I think a lot of people will be connected together if we have the common goal of protecting humanity rather than bashing like human or stupid. And Sorry, that's me. No, it's okay. <laughs> I, I agree, but I had this shift over this couple t the last two years because I really thought when I was 10 years old, I really thought that everything should go back to Stone Age and everything would be fine. Mm -hmm. Everyone would be happy, but it's not going to happen. You know, like the development is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Technology advancement is going to happen. So for us to really, really sustain this environment in our life is really for us, our point of view, we need somebody who connects us with those policy makers, those um, people in the industry who can make changes. And if somebody can convey the message to them in their words, in their communication method, not ours, I think that will make a huge leap. And I was hoping Maybe you can do it. <laughs> yeah. so everything you're saying is just really good to come. And, and that's, that was my mission. I, I wanted yeah. to set out to be the person, yes. To affect that kind of change in, in the industry. Uh, for me, it's the, like the mm. difficulty for them is always the money. It comes down to money. I think that to I think that my call to action is connected to what you're saying. I think that for people who are, you asked what can the average person, just like a regular person, what can they do? And I think that what they can do is be vocal. Right. So I think that, yeah, so if you go to a restaurant or a store and you ask for something and they don't have it, like, complain about it. Yeah. And be like, oh, well, yeah. even say, like, go as far as say, like, oh, I'm going to shop somewhere else now. And that, that's what matters. Mm -hmm. And if you are doing a beach clean, because that's what people feel, it's the thing that people feel that they can do. A lot of people do beach cleans. Um, but you can um, do a brand call out. Mm -hmm. So if you find a Starbucks cup, yep. take a photo of yourself, yep. put it on Instagram, and tag Starbucks. Shame. Be like, thanks, Starbucks. Yeah. Look what I found at the beach today. Exactly. Um, McDonald's, Coca Cola, mm -hmm. all of these companies just keep pushing, Shame. push, push, push. 
and say that, and and being really clear that I'm not going to shop there. This mm-hmm. is what you keep doing, mm-hmm. and my friends and my relatives are not going to shop there. Absolutely. And that's I think that's the best thing that like just mm-hmm. a single regular human being can so do. Hold, hold industry to the highest standards. Yeah. Right? And, and, and stand behind your word. Like really, yeah. don't shop there. Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> Which is like harder. Yeah. 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 Everyone needs something from Daiso every now and again, right? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a yeah. True. It's true. Yeah. Thanks, Arsenal. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And if, and if people keep complaining, and I know it's extra hard for Japanese people, they hate to complain, mm. um, that <clears throat> if people really do complain, then the businesses will change. Mm. This will take time, but if you yeah. keep pushing, then they'll, they'll respond. How's this? One of my clients, one of the resorts that I consult to, um, has a, a Chinese restaurant. And even in this day and age, they still serve shark fin oh, soup, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. They, they had a complaint from a customer, and, and they asked me my opinion, like, how do we deal with this complaint? I said, you got it. What? Huh? Where have you been living all this time? You cannot be serving that anymore. And uh, due to that one very vocal customer, um, they're, I'm working with them to plan an exit set strategy yeah. on that menu item. So and they can so even yeah. turn that around and they can make Use really it. good publicity. Like, exactly. we are taking this step exactly. proactively. Exactly. We are not going to serve this. Like, yeah. you should all come to our restaurant. We're shark yeah. yeah. free. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There are ways to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially if other restaurants nearby are not taking that step. Then they can be the one that is, right. and really like use that to make the other ones do it too. That's true. In Oregon or California, in Oregon, the West Coast, we had a guy coming from like the State Department to Okinawa to talk about the Salmon Safe brand. Mm. So every mm, so they brand each industry like a beer companies or restaurants, mm-hmm. and they give them this credit credibility. Of sound safe, so how they operate it will not harm the same, um, what is it, ecology? Right, yeah. ecology. So you should go there, kind yeah. of, and then yeah. that's working very well. Yeah, yeah and that goes like even further than like just the, because there's, there's are, there are a couple different um, like safe seafood recommendation mm-hmm. type things from different organizations, like Monterey Bay, I'm sure everybody's aware, that puts out the Seafood Watch publications, mm-hmm. and then. Um, there's another one um, that I think might be UN run, um, but yeah, we don't have any of those markings. Like if you go to a restaurant in Okinawa, mm-hmm. like you don't get to know if your seafood is sustainable or not. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, knows. But the salmon thing goes a step more. It's not just was it caught well. It's you know did this restaurant do anything that would jeopardize the stream that they need to reproduce? Right. So did any of your incoming ingredients? affect this ecosystem mm-hmm. and that's like I mean I don't even know how they mm-hmm. are able to trace all of those things I think that's a really big undertaking mm-hmm. but um, if you're able to go to that place with that sort of comfort that you're not causing any harm mm-hmm. then I would you know pay $20 for dinner there yeah yeah, yeah. free yeah guilt free meal it feels it tastes better yeah <laughs> Fantastic. This has been wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Um, I don't know how to wrap it up, but uh, well, I suppose in uh, in uh, the video footnotes, we'll post some links to uh, everybody's um, information that, that we have and mm-hmm. try to spread the word a little bit more, I think. Um, but, and I'll do my best to become that bridge and catalyst for, for big change and uh, Hope we can keep in in touch. Is there any way that non oysters can attend some of your oyster meetings? Oh yeah. yeah. Um, if you want to come to, so Eco Club has kind of been a little bit on hiatus because Maki and I are in our last years, yeah. um, and um, we are in like the final push for graduation. Okay. So uh, this sense. year has been very very weak on the eco yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Quiet. <laughs> but we've had a lot of new people come to OIS this year that have wanted to join. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have about like 10 ish people that are like, brand new oysters that are like, excited about it. Mm-hmm. So we're hoping to have a meeting um, and think about like next projects to get involved with mm-hmm. um, maybe next month. Yeah. 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 Ye
So, I mean, you'd be totally welcome to come, or we could have our like initial meeting and then mm -hmm. like think about how we might talk to you more in the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Contact through Facebook and stuff. We have a person from Chulalongkorn. Mm. That's like a volunteer in yeah. the on the whole event. Good. And a girl from Naha contacted mm -hmm. us a mm -hmm. few times. Yeah. So, so it's not just uh, limited to us. Yeah. And then, yeah, and uh, Giovanni is still on the island? Did he leave? I'm not sure. He might not be allowed to leave now. Uh, he's from Italy. Yeah. Um, he's a graduate student at Jamie Rimer's lab, and he did the study that I quoted with the 75% of mm -hmm. the coastline is, is concrete. Concrete, yeah. Um, and he's just a really, really charismatic, great person to be yeah. around. Yeah. So he might be someone you might also want to talk to. Mm -hmm. Jamie Rimer's lab in general has a lot of people doing really great, great mm -hmm. conservation work. Okay. Yeah. And as a friend of Sean's. Right on. Hook me up. Yeah. <laughs> so after graduation, you'll be going home? Yeah, I'll stay. You're going to stay? I'm staying. Or you're, you've got your permanent residence here. Yes. <laughs> and my husband started a business in Okinawa, so I've awesome. been this crowd. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Heard it's really good. I haven't been there yet. Oh, I should come over. Yes. A right. couple of my coworkers yeah, went there are they? Few, oh, cool. last month, I think. What is yeah. it? Bacon bar. It's a restaurant. We're trying to do We don't serve straws. We have metal straws. Yeah. And it's better for the environment than cow. That's true. Yeah, you're just a bit more. Awesome, awesome. Great. So you'll be around. And home for you is? Um, I'm from New York. Um, I'm not going back to New York. I'm going to Massachusetts next. Um, but in the Northeast. Mm. Drivable distance from family and friends. Nice. And continue. So cold. <laughs> no, there's not going to be much coral reef diving over there, right? No, I, I, when I lived in New York, I really only dove in the summertime. Um, What's there to see of it? Lots side? of really interesting wrecks. So there's a lot of World okay. War II era wrecks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we did a lot of like pier diving. Mm. And, um, you know, it's different, it's different organisms, but mm. really found little guys cool and water. stuff. Yeah. Um, for work, my husband used to be a scientist also, mm -hmm. and he studied seagrass ecology. Okay. So we would spend the entire summer um, diving in seagrass beds, mostly just making measurements of carbon and photosynthesis, but um, also collecting mud and looking at all of the different critters that live in the mud and in the, in the seagrass beds. <laughs> um, I like it. Yeah. yeah, so there's still a good diving up there, but definitely sail. Yeah, we're getting a lot of sailing there. Yeah, for sure sailing. But uh, doing more research, getting into the work. Yeah, yeah, more more microbe stuff. Yeah. Um, we're studying a specific organism called Phaeocystis, which causes um, kind of like nuisance algal blooms. It doesn't produce toxins that make humans sick, mm -hmm. um, but it produces a gelatinous substance that causes a lot of bacterial degradation and a lot of stink basically, it smells mm. like sulfur. Mm. Um, and there's been like a regime change where the spring bloom that happens every year used to be mostly diatoms and now it's shifting towards this organism Phaeocystis. And so that has a really profound effect on the ecosystem. Yeah. So I'll be studying that specific organism and how and why it blooms. Wow. And there's a lot of it over there? Mm. Yeah. Yep, a whole bunch. <laughs> Is that in stagnant water, lakes? Uh, no, so it's like a coastal bloom. Okay. Um, so the bloom that I'll be studying specifically is in um, like Massachusetts Bay, mm. like inside of mm. inside of the cave towards Boston. Mm. Wow. You get to follow your dreams mm. on the other side of the world, even. Yeah, more yeah. microbes. A few, a few. Mm. Yeah, well, you'll have to. Uh, I don't know. Do you are you going to do now or have? Or in the future, you're going to have uh, um, not just social media, but uh, somewhere where people can follow your research? Oh, so I post research stuff on Twitter. Yeah. I'm pretty active on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, all of my updates are always on Twitter. Yeah. Um, so yeah, okay. I'll there. Hmm. No, all the microbes. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty easy. They are, they are beautiful. Microscopy is really nice, really nice images. Microscopy. Yes, using microscopes <laughs> to make pictures. <laughs> no, that's, so have you ever printed out some of these big posters along the, down here sometimes? 
Um, no, those are from the CPR division, and um, they they choose who they want to be like the face for those images. Mm -hmm. okay. They they changed it now sometimes. They switched. Uh, yeah, they, there's been two versions of the of the tunnel yeah. images, so okay. they might do it again someday. Mm -hmm. When's your next exhibition? Don't know yet. Uh, we'll see. I got I got to plan something to make it. So just doing mm -hmm. it. You know, do the manual yeah. version. We should do another um, auction yeah. event. Yeah, that's right. Those are really fun. Yeah. But my, my next project is going to be the Hermit Crab project as well. I'm just get a whole bunch printed and have basically a traveling uh, photo exhibition to bring awareness. So mm -hmm. I think that would be really good as well. You know, for that specifically only, and then do a lot of other things. But yeah, that's a great idea. We're going to do that again. And that, that always pops up on the memory. You know, the fact that yeah. those are great times. Yeah. A lot of good crowds would show up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it was fun. good. We raised money for conservation for good cause. And it was more fun when I wasn't organizing. <laughs> it was much more fun when I was yeah, just a guest. Yeah, 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 always, right? You know, <laughs> but yeah, they do a great job, especially with the Eco Club. You come out mm -hmm. to that event and it, it was mm -hmm. done very well and uh, really mm -hmm. educational. Right on. And uh, yeah, a lot of good stuff. Traditionally, Eco Club was meeting once a month or something? We used to meet twice a month. Yeah. yeah. Last year we met twice a month. Mm -hmm. um, this year we haven't met at all. Okay. Usually that's here somewhere, someone's house, or. Yeah, usually here. Um, usually at lunchtime. Okay. Um, on campus. Yeah, but like in a common area that people can get to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. I'm gonna keep an eye on it. Hope. Uh, hope you guys will. I don't know. Keep up with it before you leave. Until you leave, at least. Maybe one more event. That's nice. Really. <laughs> One more event, but many meetings in between. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It takes a lot to pull it off. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think uh, we, we might even be able to facilitate some uh, you know, event sponsorship mm -hmm. and stuff, which will, you know, have some profound effect on, mm -hmm. you know, the influence. Yeah, we didn't really talk about the events, but the events were... The main goal of the events was to kind of demonstrate that you can have an event mm -hmm. without using plastic. Yeah. Um, so we have really amazing local restaurants that mm. participated mm. and were willing to serve their food without plastic. Mm. Like the events were plastic free events, but that was really the whole point. It was just to like have fun without plastic. Yeah. Yeah. And that we were hoping that like other people that were not part of the club would see that and be like, oh, we can do this too. Yeah. So if we did something like that again, like one more before mm. we leave, boys, yeah. um, definitely having more visibility of the right sort, like the right people. Like yeah. people from hotels be like, oh look, wow. Yeah. They can have this giant party and not yeah. use any plastic. Crazy. <laughs> well thank you so much yeah. for your time here today and, and sharing your your wealth of knowledge and passion. I really appreciate it and, and I feel inspired to pull my finger out and do what I was born to do. You know. Start, <laughs> no poke, start poking. Get out that big stick. Uh, appreciate it very much and I look forward to catching up again soon. Thank you, Sean.